Welcome to Digital Asset News, take the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, unbelievable news. First up, $100 million white from BitMEX as Bitcoin dives $1,500 in three minutes. Also, Mohamed El Arian, the chief economist for Alliance, breaks it down why the central banks and the Fed are in a lose-lose-lose situation and what's going to happen in the next 6 to 12 months. And good news for Ripple and XRP. Potentially, Western Union aims to buy MoneyGram to foil peer competition, and this could be big news and maybe just what the doctor ordered for Ripple. But first, let's take a look at what the heck is going on with the market. So, Bitcoin, our main player, King Crypto, uh, took a big dive. Uh, looks like it jumped over $10,000 last night. I think it hit 10.3 or somewhere around there. And now it dropped to 9,500 roughly. And it is June 2nd, I believe, uh, 12.30 Texas time. And uh, if we take a look at this, let's see just what the heck is going on. So 9,500, uh, that's not uh, fantastic. Look at this fantastic drop. Just looked like it just dropped from... Uh, <laughs> just dropped off the face of the earth so it looks like it was 10 1 excuse me i guess 10 159 that was the highest point maybe what was this over here 10 2 all right at around 545 and everything was pretty much stable and then big dump and here we are so uh, dropped down to 9300 and we are somewhat in recovery so nice little dip or as some people will call that eh, just a little correction so what does that mean for traders, especially uh, uh, for BitMEX and levered traders? Uh, looks like it's bad news. So what happened here? So just over 12 hours after Bitcoin crossed 10,000 for the first time in weeks, cryptocurrency dove off a cliff. Approximately 20 minutes ago, crypto was hit with a barrage of sell orders that took the asset as low as 8,600 on BitMEX and spot exchange and some other derivative exchanges. Cryptocurrency held a low 9,000, which is at 9,500 right now. So that's amazing, which is uh, it's kind of a bummer because I got to tell you, when I take a look at uh, the news, you take a look at just, you know, kind of get a feel of things, of uh, where things are going on. And uh, the indicators, you know, you'd see these these articles like fund manager thinks Bitcoin is primed to rip above uh, even after a $1,000 move. Top analysts expects Ethereum to soon plunge against Bitcoin. Bitcoin braces for 11000 on weaker dollar demand. Uh, Bitcoin just saw its biggest breakout ever, and that means 10 k is just a start. Bitcoin's price spread on the CME is super bullish and foretells major upside. Um, I never put too much stock into uh, articles that you know say there's an indicator here and this is going to happen and there's this golden cross and I cannot tell you how many times I've heard about this golden cross or this death cross whatever else and just kind of like Bitcoin does whatever it wants to do so um, yeah sure that's what's going on with all these different exchanges and whatnot so okay let me back up real quick so on BitMEX the asset Bitcoin, built more than $1,500 in three minutes in a massive move that liquidated many market participants. That's a bummer. So here's the data from SKU, sure enough. And then what it talks about here is this was a Bitcoin long squeeze, uh, where essentially there's a difference between the price of a Bitcoin contract on BitMEX and a Bitcoin coin on Coinbase. So people are going into BitMEX, and essentially what they did is the basis, it hit negative 6%, showing that there was sell pressure on BitMEX that didn't exist on Coinbase and other spot exchanges. So there again, we go to down, downward, down, 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 down. And that's just one of those things. That's just one of those things that happens uh, for leverage trading and especially on BitMEX. And it seems like it just keeps happening over and over and over again. And I know that there's a lot of traders on, on the channel. If you want to trade, that's fine. I, I don't. Uh, uh, begrudge you anything I just think it is is like gambling and then people always say oh but you know they can just put stop losses in and no big deal well it obviously is a big deal because uh, it just says it right here a uh, hundred million dollars was wiped out now I'm not a trader I don't do any trading uh, so let me know where I'm incorrect here in the comments section about did it just that a hundred million dollars worth of people just didn't put in some kind of uh, stop losses and they just don't know how to trade or what the heck happened here because to me it just seems like gambling i lived in vegas for a long time and that's just how i see it actually uh, real quick before we move on i just want to make sure everybody's uh, on the same page so i don't know if you realize how simple dollar cost averaging is so i'm just going to show you in 30 seconds so you're going to log into coinbase or whatever your exchange is you can't do it on every exchange i know coinbase allows it i know cash app so i use coinbase simple from there, just click on portfolio and then go to set up recurring purchase. 
And then from there, you pick your poison. What do you want to buy? You want to buy Ethereum, Bitcoin, whatever, and just pay with whatever uh, bank account you have. And then just put in that money and then click on that little times thing, that little clock. And then in this situation, I just, I just put 25 bucks. I'm going to buy Ethereum every week. I preview buy, I accept, and I'm done. And that's it. That's all you got to do. And it's like the Ronco food dehydrators. Just set it and forget it. That's all you got to do. Uh, so that's dollar cost averaging in a nutshell. Uh, it's not too complex. Even I can do it. I'm not that smart and I'm able to figure it out. So uh, any questions put in the comment section. Let's move on to the next uh, story. Next up. So this is more my speed. I like to think about you know what is going on in the markets, traditional and in our markets. And not only that, but um, what is happening as it kind of all converges. And I like to look at fundamentals. This is Chief Economist for Alliance. This is Mohammed El Arian. And he really gets asked, the question is like, look, the Fed's in the market and they're propping everything up. So what's the problem? Um, you know, there's free money, there's helicopter money for everyone. So why is sounding the alarm? Why just be so much of an alarmist? And uh, what's the worst case scenario? So let's just take a listen. So I, I tell people, as I said with you um, last week, I understand people who bet on moral hazard. I understand people who bet on the Fed backstop. I don't do it. I, I don't think that's a good way to invest. I'd rather invest on the basis of fundamentals. But I understand that. And the question is really not to investors. The question is to the Fed. Why has the Federal Reserve continuously conditioned markets to expect them to step in and repress any volatility? And isn't it time to stop doing that because you, you, you end up not only undermining the system itself, but you undermine the credibility of an institution that is critical to the well-being of this and future generations. And I couldn't agree more. I mean, it just seems like we have the Fed step in and they're pretty much doing everything that they can do to prop up the market. And you know what? In the beginning, that's fine. But if you're going to keep doing it and doing it and doing it, then, you know, where does that lead us? What kind of road are we going to go down? And I just don't think it's it's a fantastic policy. And I certainly don't think that the uh, markets themselves uh, are based in reality right now. It just seems like the S&P goes up, Dow goes up. Everybody's like, no big deal because the Fed's going to bail us out. And it just can't be that way. I don't think, but I could be wrong. So this kind of leads into the next question, which is, you know, what if, I mean, if the Fed does that all the time, that's great. But what if the Fed and the central banks come out and they change their whole policy or, just, or, or they just change half their policy and they stop bailing everyone out, meaning they're going to stop buying junk bonds. They're going to stop about negative. They're going to stop talking about negative interest rates. They're going to stop propping up the S&P. So what could potentially happen there? Recovery here, just as we're trying to reopen, I imagine we'd have even bigger problems. We would. I mean, we are now increasingly in a lose, lose, lose situation for central banks. You lose if you try to undo what you've been doing for the reason you've cited. You lose if you try to do more. And that's what markets are pushing. Markets are pushing for negative interest rates. Markets are pushing for yield curve control. Markets are pushing for even stronger forward guidance. Why? The markets are functioning fine. Valuations are very high. Access to capital markets is not an issue for companies, and yet markets are pressing for more and more. And you also lose if you don't do anything because you have this massive disconnect. And that's the that's the problem. So here's the problem. When people just expect to get bailed out, there's no risk. There's no consequences. And basic reality goes out the window and things just don't make sense. But I believe, I really, I truly believe this, that reality is going to come in and it's going to come in fast and it's going to slap some of these, uh, you know, markets uh, back into shape because we, I feel we just can't keep going uh, like this, like the way that we're going in the traditional markets. So here's my question then. Do you think that we can keep this up for years? Because that's what the Fed is talking about. You know, we're, they're like, we're ready to step in and do this as much as we have to. So do you think we can keep this up for years because the dollar is so strong? Or do you think that the Fed and central banks not only have their limits, but we will see a huge downturn or even maybe even a moderate downturn over the next six to 18 months? So let me know what you think in the comment section. I'd like to see what everybody's thinking and gauge everything else. Let's move on. So the next part makes the most sense to me. Uh, and this is where Muhammad talks about the things that we actually need to focus on, which are people and not big businesses. And this is why I always listen to this guy, because he makes a lot of sense to me. So let's just take a, it's only about a minute or so. That's a consequence. Now, what do you do? You focus on people. Andrew, 
we have done a great job restoring market access. We have done a great job opening the markets for bond issuance. But companies are laying off people, and we haven't focused on people. The Main Street program hasn't gotten off the ground yet. So I think it's really important to change the mindset. Realize that the support of markets and companies, as important as that is, is necessary but not sufficient. You need one more thing, which is access to people. Otherwise, the social elements will start imp imprinting on the economic elements. Look, I don't support well, the looting. I don't support the mm -hmm. violence. I think it's awful. I think it's awful. But I think the peaceful protesters have a point in saying, look, it's about opportunities. It's about inclusion and participation. And unless we take that seriously, this economy is going to be so imbalanced that it's going to be difficult to produce high economic growth. Imbalances. Imbalances. There is a, something to be said about the gap between the haves and the have-nots. And when I, when I see these videos and I, and I listen to uh, different people and I read the comments and, and I, I get more information, it's all connected. And it's all connected to the traditional markets, digital asset markets, to stabilizing this economy by way of employees and small businesses, which is how it, is, it was supposed to be. However, the problem is, is that when you pour money into big businesses, which is what the Fed did, they did a top-down approach. And I just see it as creating more imbalance between the haves, the have-nots, the middle income to no income. And uh, I just see it's going to be a problem. And I think it's going to be a problem for years to come. So let me know what you think in the comment section below. But I can see kind of where things are going. Hopefully I'm wrong. Well, we'll see. Let's move on to our last story. So last up, Western Union aims to buy MoneyGram to foil peer competition. And just to start things off uh, on the right foot here, just so you know, MoneyGram uh, and Ripple uh, and XRP are all interconnected. So MoneyGram and, and, and Ripple are connected and they're using XRP for their cross-border payments. This was on December 19, 2019. And uh, this is uh, MoneyGram CEO Alexander Holm states, we went live with Ripple at the end of July. Since then, on a cumulative basis, we just the other day surpassed 100 million in total volume that we've pushed through the platform. This is on this is XRP based uh, ODL or on demand liquidity. So uh, banks can sign up with Ripple. This is true. They can use their software because Ripple is a software company. But just so everybody's clear, MoneyGram uses the cryptocurrency. XRP for on-demand liquidity. So this was so interesting to the XRP community because they're like, great. So Western Union, uh, which has been around forever since the 1800s, uh, they're going to buy MoneyGram. And that's going to be good because it's going to get the uh, message out there. I share a different opinion. I are, I don't think that is true. So what this article talks about is, uh, so positive is that shares of both companies were up. This is MoneyGram and Western Union. Following the news that uh, they were going to be an acquisition, 3.5% for MoneyGram and 6.15% in the day's trading. MoneyGram has a ma market cap of $154 million, which is peanuts, really, and it lags behind Western Union's market cap of $8 billion. Here's what's in interesting, though. Western Union has more than 550,000 agent locations across more than 200 countries, and MoneyGram has 380,000 agent locations. So, uh, you know, pretty close, I would say. Uh, it's just that there is a uh, bigger disconnect between the actual money that each one has. So, this article states the acquisition will bring together the first and second largest global send and receive networks, creating a powerful new player in international money transfer business that will add shareholder value to both companies. And I think this is why uh, the XRP community is so happy about this. I mean, most are uh, because they're like, hey, this is good because now we can get we can get acquired and then they're going to start to use XRP and it's just going to blow up. And I'm like, I don't think that's how it works. I don't think MoneyGram really wants to do that. Uh, I think they're just absorbing them because they they don't like the competition. Anyhow, um, getting into the negative parts, MoneyGram has been losing its profitability and sustained success and sustained successive losses in the last three quarters. Total revenues in the first in the first quarter further fell due to the pandemic spread and government issued shelter in place orders. This has caused a slump in the company's walk in business because you have to understand that uh, Western Union and MoneyGram they have physical locations where people can walk in. I myself do not like to invest into brick and mortar uh, type of companies because uh, of businesses. Um, 
I mean, just for myself, I mean, I will invest in Amazon. I will invest in a Tesla, obviously, but uh, I don't like to start my own business at brick and mortar because there's so much overhead. And uh, I think that's what's happening here uh, with these two type of organizations. The um, uh, online is actually doing really well. And it states here, MoneyGram has been making concerted efforts to develop and build its digital money remittance platforms like a fintech startup, which generates more profitability than its brick and mortar business. Of course, right? When you have a brick and mortar, uh, like we see here in this picture, uh, you have you know the cost of the rent, you have electricity, you have taxes. I mean, why well, is taxes? But I mean, tax on that on that location. You have to pay for employees and everything else. It's just it's just a uh, uh, a big money problem. So if you don't have to deal with that everything's online everything's great so just so you know uh, back in 2018 actually Western Union actually trialed uh, XRP and they pretty much said look we've been doing this for for months and we have not seen any benefit to it uh, whatsoever now you could take a look at that and say well uh, that's just a, a company who knows that uh, XRP is going to uh, change the world and it's going to be great and it's actually uh, can uh, give them cost benefits and them just they're just poo-pooing all over it but here's the thing uh, that's what they said and they're like no we don't see it now moving forward to what i see it as is to me this looks like a situation where you've got uh, blockbuster trying to acquire netflix all over again that's how i kind of see this whole situation rolling out and if we just look back in time uh, we could look back in history Blockbuster back in 1992. I know for some of you that's a ancient history. For me, it just happened yesterday. <laughs> and Blockbuster was opening a store every 24 hours, as it sought to become the industry leader. Uh, they acquired British video rental chain Ritz, and U.S.-based major video on Errol's Blockbuster grew to more than 2,800 stores. And that's the same thing with like Western Union. Western Union has been around forever. I mean, they've been around since 1851. And then MoneyGram is the new kid on the block at 1940 when they were founded. So it's not like they're like a big spring chicken MoneyGram. It's been around for quite some time. Just Western Union has been around a heck of a lot longer. So it's the same thing. Blockbuster, um, Netflix. So. That happened in 92. In 97, the moment that Blockbuster inadvertently triggered its own downfall, the customer Reed Hastings was charged 40 bucks for being late and returning Apollo 13. Out of frustration, Hastings wanted to create Netflix. So, bummer of a deal. But it worked out pretty well for me. I love Netflix. And in 2000, uh, this is when it all kind of came to fruition. Opportunity doesn't knock twice, but it did when DVD subscription service Netflix... DVD uh, subscription. I, I remember when Netflix was not online. It was just, they would just mail in DVDs. And they were just some small company. It was like, ah, uh, it was like five bucks a month or something. And people bought it. But uh, uh, they went to Netflix and, or they went to Blockbuster to go, hey, we're going to sell it to you for 50 million. And the company declined. And uh, also that same year, that company, which is Blockbuster, took in a staggering $800 million in late fees, which may have 16% of revenue. 16%. That was a billion dollar company back in 2000. So in just four short, so in four short years, Blockbuster separates from Viacom, launches an online DVD subscription, but it's already seven years behind the industry leader Netflix, despite having 9,000 stores globally and being worth around $5 billion. The writing was already on the wall in just a short amount of time. And then in 2010, Blockbuster filed for bankruptcy. So when we take a look at this article, I think Western Union uh, is kind of like, you know what? We don't want to be Blockbuster. I, and I just think they took a lesson from history and they don't want to go down that route. So the question I have myself was, and I question I have for you I, would be, could Blockbuster have succeeded if they just would have bought Netflix for that $50 million back in uh, 2000? So I think maybe, but maybe not, because Blockbuster had an old way of doing things mentality, and they were probably bloated with upper management and executives and not as nimble as the startup Netflix. So I think the same holds true for MoneyGram. And although it's not like although it's not like MoneyGram is a like a new cutting edge company, like we just talked about, it's 1940, uh, it's much newer uh, than um, Western Union. So could Western Union uh, absorb MoneyGram and then start to use uh Ripple's technology, which is XRP. Sure. I think it's going to happen. I don't think so. But uh, I could be wrong. And um, I defer to people who are experts on this. And I would, I'm would i going to recommend Jungle Inc. So if you want to learn more about this, go to Jungle Inc. He is uh, big into XRP, very heavy. 
he did a great video it's 10 minutes uh, very simple and he lays it all out for you so check that out uh, for a different perspective that's what i would say and that's it for today's video so I want to say thanks for sticking with me. Uh, and last but not least, let me say thank you to all my supporters. I really appreciate it. So if you don't know, uh, underneath every video, there's a join button. It doesn't, uh, you don't join anything special. <laughs> there's not like a, uh, a private section for members and non-members. It just, it should just say tip because that's essentially what it is. So uh, level one, they pay a couple bucks and I appreciate it. And I want to say thanks to everybody who has uh, contributed. Uh, it's really nice. And then level two, they pay a little bit more and they uh, get a shout out. So I want to say shout out to All Right Soft. Also, Wen Mullet, who is always holding it down in the premiere section. Wen Mullet, I appreciate you. Thanks, brother. Also, myself, who else? Dave Plum, the straight talking guy. Grant Sharman. Bruce Wood, Baking Benjamins. They do a lot of things with Tezos as far as baking. Noel Flippin Vegas, Martin Lewin, Michael Ralph, William Howell, Chris Alexander, Tessie Ryusaki, Positive, Fire Swing Golf, and our last one, JC Durex Code, Crypto Veritas, John Miller, The Office, L. Merg, and Michael Jeffrey. So to everybody, I want to say thank you so much for contributing. I appreciate everybody that uh, goes out of their way. It makes me feel special. Thank you. And that's it for today. So uh, thanks for watching. See you on the next one.